a very sensory session on the limits of capitalization. Before we go too far, I really do want to know where you, each of you is coming from today. And so I'll ask you to answer a couple of poll questions. So let me go ahead and launch that. So um, the, the questions we're asking, basically what's, what proportion of your wines in 2020 got capitalized? 2020 wasn't a super uh, high bricks year for us. So probably a little bit more than 2019, but just curious how many, how many of your wines are getting capitalized. Um, when you are deciding on capitalization, what is your normal target alcohol when you're capitalizing for a red wine? We'll be focusing on red wines today. And then sometimes when you look at that target alcohol and you look at your bricks and you're trying to decide how much to capitalize, um, sometimes you're a little bit, it, it's a little bit hard to decide to, to capitalize that much. So at what, what actual um, sugar, uh, sugar addition are you starting to say, oh, that might be getting close to my limit. So where are you, where are you starting to see that alarm bell go off? to say, uh, this might be more than I wanna be adding. And also just to know that these are completely anonymous, so you can answer honestly and not worry about anybody judging the answers that you're giving. So, um, so as you guys are doing that, we will do just a little bit of um, intro information on capitalization, if I can get this to roll. Okay. So just again, just to define our terms here, capitalization, we are just talking about adding sugar or grape juice um, to raise the potential alcohol of our resulting wine. So that's the whole point of, of trying to do this. It's pretty straightforward and not difficult. Most, most people are able to do this in their wineries. Um, historically, this is not a new thing. So the Romans were actually known to add honey to, to their fermenting musts in order to improve the body and the mouthfeel of the wine. Um, the practice itself was made famous by uh, Napoleon's Minister of, Architect or of, of Agriculture, Jean-Antoine Cheptal, um, in the early 1800s. And basically, he really advocated for the addition of sugar in order to strengthen and preserve the wine. It did become a very popular thing to do. It was thought to actually um, save a couple of vintages in the Mosul that were fairly, fairly cold and wouldn't have had stable wines without capitalization. But of course, it can also lead to abuse. And that also happened in the 1800s in Europe. Uh, farmers started to overcrop their grapes to the extent where they weren't able to accumulate enough sugar naturally, just thinking that they could go ahead and, and add a lot of sugar back. So as a result, the uh, European countries started to, to make legislation or laws about how much capitalization could occur. Um, so when we look at today's European laws, we can see a couple of different things here. And again, in the US, we're not really held by these laws, but as we start to think about the limits of capitalization, sometimes um, we can gain some wisdom from, from these folks that have been making wine for so long. So as we look at the European laws, we can see that first of all, it's not the same for everyone. So um, the amount of allowable increase through capitalization is different depending pretty much on, on the growing region and how cold and or hot that region is. Um, so we have that the allowable increase, but also you can notice that there is sort of a limit there to say, if you're capitalizing in Germany, you can add up to 3% alcohol, but you can't capitalize beyond about 12% alcohol for the red. So thinking about that question of how much, how much capitalization is enough and too much, um, you can see that it's, it's different for different styles of wine or regions of wine as well. So that's one of the questions we kind of want to suss out is, you know, what about for Virginia? What's the what's a good target to be to be moving toward for the wines that we grow here in Virginia and for your wines in particular. Um, of course, here in the United States, we don't have these this kinds of legislation. We are allowed to do a number of different things. The only legal requirements that we have is that we we use pure dry sugar or concentrated fruit juice from the same fruit. So as, as winemakers, we can only use grape juice, uh, cider makers can only use apple juice. Um, and the other thing is that we can only raise our bricks up to 25% by capitalization. You might get higher than 25 bricks by other means, but not through, you're not allowed to do that by capitalization. Some states do have additional regulations. Virginia is not one of them, so. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what you, what, how you guys were answering this, the poll. So when we look at the proportion of wines that were capitalized last year, we do see that, that a lot of the, 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 the majority were between 50 and 75% or the, the high, highest amount there. So 2020, again, was not a super ripe year. So it's not surprising to think that we were doing a lot of capitalization in 2020. Um, when we look at the, the target alcohols, the target alcohols for capitalization are somewhere 
and in the, the 12 to 13 and a half range um, with 13 to 13.5 being being sort of a, a high range there. So I'm I'm interested to see how high that is. So we'll, we'll see how that looks today. So, um, and then the maximum amount that you're comfortable with for red must, um, most of you are, are landing before 2%, although there's a couple of books that are going a little bit higher than that. Um, and again, we'll look at those, uh, at some examples of that today too, to see some side-by-side -side tasting um, as we go along. All right. So just right be uh, before we jump into our experiments, I think it is helpful as we kind of think about looking at chapitalization, what would we expect the, this ethanol to be doing in our wine? So again, when we're looking at targets, US law tells us that, that table wine, well, when Bruce wrote his book, table wine was between nine and 14% um, legally. I'm pretty sure that 14% is now 16% because our tax bracket has moved up to 16 um, because of, of the uh, pretty much what's going on on the West Coast. So, um, so that gives us a really big target range. So thinking about how much do I actually chaptalize toward? What am I looking for that ethanol to do? It's helpful to know some of the things that the ethanol might be doing in our wine. So the first thing is that it's just lending stability. So a lot of our micro, a lot of the microbes that might live in wine are less likely to live in wine that have higher alcohol. Um, that includes our spoilage organisms. And, and really we can see that, you know, even in fermentation, we have a large number of organisms that kind of die off as soon as we get to a certain amount of alcohol. But we also have to think about that on the other side, if we're chapitalizing too high, we're, we, we can get to the point where we're affecting our Saccharomyces as well. We can shift their metabolism um, and, and eventually we could we could cause them to stick the fermentation, but certainly shifting the, meta the, the metabolism of the, of the yeast are an important consideration there. In addition to uh, the function of stability, ethanol does act as a solvent. So it, it acts as a solvent for other compounds, mostly nonpolar compounds. And the most important nonpolar compounds in our red wines are phenolics. These are basically things that aren't as soluble in water, but are more soluble in, in ethanol. So the more alcohol you have, the more you chaptalize, or chapitalization you do, um, we, would, we would predict that we would get additional extraction of our phenolics along the way. The other thing that alcohol does is it sort of makes, because it makes those nonpolar molecules more soluble, it makes them less likely to be lost during fermentation as sort of CO2 is going through that must. Um, it basically holds on to those, to those compounds. So the phenolics are certainly there, but we also have some nonpolar um, aroma compounds that, that we might get a little bit better retention when we have a little bit more ethanol in there. But then ethanol itself does have, have direct sensory effects. Ethanol itself is, does lend viscosity and palate weight to our wines. It does um, lend a sense of sweetness and it also amplifies other sweet tastes, which is why a lot of times we'll think of, of wines with higher ethanol as being fruitier. Those are, those are things that we tend to associate with sweetness. Um, but that only works up to a point. There is some point at which the ethanol becomes sort of burning and is no longer sweet, but is kind of a hot flavor. And, and there's not, not really a, a, a exact point where that happens. Um, that shift depends on what else is happening in the rest of the matrix of the wine. So we can think about, for example, petite men saying we have these high alcohols, but we also have um, this, this sort of high acidity, which sometimes can make it be really burning instead of sweet. Um, the uh, ethanol will also in, influence the volatility of our, our aromatics again, but getting back to that idea of, um, are they more likely to stay in solution or they're more likely to sort of come out in the glass? That depends on the, the chemistry of whether they're polar or non-polar and whether they're getting held onto or pushed out. Um, it, the presence of ethanol can actually change what the yeast are making. So the more ethanol is in there, the more yeast are going to make glycerol, succinic acid, and esters, again, up to a point until they get stressed and stop making those things. The effect on bitterness really just depends on who you're reading and probably on what the matrix of the surrounding wine looks like. And then ethanol sometimes can also diminish green or unripe characteristics that might be coincident with this addition of sweetness or fruitiness. Um, we tend to see those all going together. Um, there's a study that came out that really kind of sparked this whole conversation in terms of us doing these experiments that came out of Washington State. Um, uh, Emma Sherman did the work in Jim Harbertson's lab. And I've talked about this in the past, so I'm just going to kind of run through it really quickly. But they looked at, at Merlot grapes that were harvested at three different picks. Um, several weeks apart from one another, and then they manipulated the sugar level so that each pick 
could was either chaptalized up to the sugar levels of the other picks or sanyed and watered back to the sugar levels of the other picks so that they had sort of a, a three by three matrix of, of pick dates and sugar rates. And they did, they did chemical and sensory analysis on this. When they did their sensory analysis on this, what they found was that the sensory descriptors for the low alcohol wines, regardless of whether they were picked early or late, tended to be things we associate with being underripe. So vegetal, sour, bell pepper, and the sensory descriptors for the higher alcohol wines, regardless of when they were picked, tend to be things we associate more with ripeness. So fruit, spice, body, um, those sorts of things. And I feel like their conclusions, these are picked straight from their paper, their conclusions basically said that, you know, ethanol had a greater effect on the wine sensory properties than the fruit maturity did from the, from the study that they saw. Um, and really that, that adding ethanol made those underripe characters seem more ripe. Um, so when we read this, we sort of felt like this might be a, a, a good approach for some of our some of our Virginia red wines that sometimes can seem thin or less than ripe. So in 2019, I, uh, Mathieu Fino did sort of a, a round of experiments with this in a Merlot um, that kind of doesn't get a lot of bricks accumulation. Um, it came in at about 20 bricks with a potential alcohol of 11%. He did a number of different um, different manipulations on that, but for our purposes today, we'll focus on the idea that he had a control. He had one where he added 30 grams per liter of sugar and another where he added 50 grams per liter of sugar. Um, and then we did chemical and sensory analysis. You guys did that sensory analysis in a virtual sensory session about a year ago. Um, when, he, when we did our chemical analysis, it looked like his control was at about 10 and percent. Um, his 30, per, or his 30 gram per liter ad was at about 12.2% alcohol. And then his larger ad was about 13.3% alcohol. And when we looked at all of the sensory numbers that came out of that, what we found was that there were significant increases in your descriptive scores for aromatic intensity, fruit intensity, fruit character, and the perception of ripeness with the increase in chaptalization. For some of those, we needed to go all the way to 50 to get the full effect, like the aromatic intensity. For some of those, there wasn't a significant difference between the 30 and the 50, but there was a significant difference over control. So um, at the end of all of that, then we thought, you know, maybe this is something that's worth uh, following up to see what will happen in other, in other uh, varieties in other years. Remember, 2019 was a pretty ripe year. Um, so will this also work in our year like 2020, where we had a, a cooler vintage and, and not as many um, as, as many sort of warm days to be able to accumulate that. So it turns, so at that point, um, basically I started to, to recruit folks to, to do this. And so at this point, I'll bring Kirsty back up here and ask you, Kirsty. now I, I actually really recruited you to do your study um, on chaptalization in Merlot this year, but you agreed to do that for your own reasons. So can you tell us a little bit about why you were interested in this question and why this was a good, good match for what you're doing at Blenheim? Sure, I think what sparked the interest was the Harbertson demonstration or talk at the BWA meeting a couple of years ago. And then tasting Mathieu's wines last year, I was really struck by the fact how different the sugar addition made the wine. I thought it changed the wine completely. And I, I like manipulating things where you're just changing one variable. I like that it's not adding you know, some enological product. It's something that I generally add anyway sometimes if I have to, sugar. And I also thought it would be interesting to see, Mathieu and I have fairly, I would say fairly different winemaking styles and winemaking goals. So I thought it would be interesting to see in a very kind of on the other end of the spectrum in terms of intensity and structure, how, how sugar would affect basically lighter wines like the style that I make. So I was interested in doing that. Uh, we also happen to have a couple of blocks of Merlot that just never get ripe. So. I think we all have a couple of blocks of Merlot that just never get right. So, um, so before you did this experiments, when you were doing your chaptalization, what was your normal sort of target and or limit for chaptalization? What was normal for you? I'm usually happy around 12% alcohol in general. Um, if I chaptalize, I might go a percent and a half maximum, but I've always shied away from big sugar adds mostly because I've been always told that it's going to throw the balance of the wine off and that you'll notice that it's chaptalized. And so I was always shy before, but after seeing Mathieu's experiments last year, I thought, well, if I want to see a difference, I might as well go all the way. And that's why I chose to do, you know, around 44, 45 grams per liter sugar add. And, and one other thing before we jump into the experiment, you, you mentioned that you and Mathieu have somewhat different um, 
goals for the wines that you're making. So what's your winemaking goal for this Merlot? Like where will it go? And what are you thinking about as you're deciding, you know, what approach to take with it? Sure. Well, I'm looking for, I'm looking for fruit. Um, I'm looking for, yeah, juicy fruit. Uh, nothing stays in barrels longer than a year. Merlot is something that stays six, maybe eight months in barrel, is bottled. And in the olden days, um, something that was fairly quick to, to sell. I mean, we, we bottle before, before, before harvest starts. So fruit forward, less intense, um, drinkable now, nothing, nothing with huge aging potential. So the experiment itself was really straightforward. So we don't, it, it basically the, the grapes were destemmed into different vessels. Um, you know, one set of vessels got no chaptalization and one set of vessels were chaptalized with 44 grams per liter of sugar. Um, and and Kirsty does this on the third day after inoculation, just probably once it gets warm, um, it's, it's time to do that chaptalization. She was willing to do this on two separate lots for us. And so we do have a true replicate in this sense. So this is a, a field of Merlot that has two different clones on it. So she separates out those clones. So we'll, when you look at the chemistry data, you'll see chaptalized and unchaptalized for clone 34 or 347. And then you'll see chaptalized and unchaptalized for clone 181. Um, and that's really helpful because if we see an effect, we can say, did we see an effect in both of them? Or did we just see an effect in one of the two thinking it maybe is not quite as robust in an effect. Um, so just so you know what you've got in front of you, um, if you are in group one, wines 102 and 753 were not chaptalized, whereas wine 962 was chaptalized. If you're in group two, wine 505 was not chaptalized. Wines 371 and 436 were chaptalized. If you're in group three, wines 235 and 482 were not chaptalized. And wine 431 was chaptalized. And if you're in group four, wines uh, wine 215 was not chaptalized and wines 980 and 414 were chaptalized. Um, and I will show that again before we talk about our, our sensory impressions, but just so that you know what you've got as we go through. So um, the, the fruit itself did come in at about 20, the first clone was at 20.3 bricks, the second one was at 20.4 bricks. Um, after Kirsty did her, her chaptalization, she did see a big bump in the bricks there. Um, but again, this happened, the, the chaptalization happened a little bit after fermentation had already started. So she might've gotten some brick depletion before she, um, she got to that. So when we look at the numbers, keep that in mind. Um, when we look at the fermentation curves themselves, um, we, we can see when the chaptaliz chaptalization was done. Um, in clone 347, we do see that the chaptalization basically um, meant that the fermentation itself went on for a couple, of, a couple more days. Um, and in clone four, 347, we do see a little bit more heat accumulating as a um, in the chaptalized uh, wine versus the non-chaptalized wine. And we would, we would expect that if there's more sugar around, the yeast have more metabolism and generate more heat. In clone 181, we also see a little bit of a delay there in the, in the fermentation. We don't see as big an effect with the, um, with the temperature there. Um, but we also have to remember with temperature that that, that is also, um, subject to what's going on in the ambient environment. So one of these may be in a, you know, one set might be in a colder space and one set might be in a warmer space. They are Tevens. So there is some spatial difference there sometimes as well. Um, when we look at the chemistry of the finished wines, we can see um, that the unchaptalized wine in 347 finished at 12.2% alcohol. We'll look at this in a, and at sort of toward the end. That is a little bit more alcohol conversion than we would probably normally expect. Um, whereas uh, clone 181 finished at 11.76. Um, but both of those, we do see a big change in the alcohol between the unchaptalized and the chaptalized, which is what we expect. We don't see big differences in any of the other measures, the volatile acidity, the pH, or the titratable, titratable acidity. We wouldn't expect to see those, but we do take a look just to make sure that there's not any like big shifts that, that we're not expecting along the way. In Kirsty's experiment, we did see um, in, in both clone 347 and 181, we did see a little bit increase in color intensity in, in the chaptalized over the unchaptalized wine. Now, color is so complicated. There's a lot of different factors that influence the color, um, most notably the SO2 and the pH, and then what other cofactors were around. We did measure the SO2 and the pH at the same time that the color was, was measured. Um, so for clone 347, the free sulfur was measured at exactly the same amount, and the pHs were very similar. 
Um, in clone 181, the, the free sulfurs were a little bit different. So maybe that, that bigger difference in color that we see in 181 may also be reflecting what's happening with the free sulfur. We were then able to do some phenolic analysis of these as well. Um, and we can see, at least in this case, that we do have slightly higher anthocyanins in our chaptalized versus unchaptalized wine. So that goes along with what we saw of the color. And I'll ask you all in just a minute if you saw, if you if that was a perceptible difference or not. Um, but I think the other sort of notable result here is really we see a, a, a kind of a notable or, or noticeable increase in the tannin. So we have about a 20 to 30% increase in tannin. And we did see that increase in tannin in both of those clones. Um, so that's another question to say, like, do we feel like we have a difference in astringency in those wines along the way? Um, but again, most of this is something that, um, that isn't going to really show up necessarily in our, in our chemical analysis. It's going to be much more what we see in, um, in our sensory. So let's go ahead and take a look at, let's see if I can that. Do that. There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and ask you all about a couple of sensory questions here. I can think of, if I can get to my second poll, there we go. So, the, um, so I'm curious to know if you were able to tell the difference between the wines. Um, and if you were, if there was a preference, if there was a wine that you preferred or didn't prefer or didn't like. Um, but then I'm also, once we kind of get to the, if, if, you, if you did have a preference, if you'd be willing to either raise your hand and tell us what the preference was or just unmute yourself and tell us what the preference was. Um, or um, the same thing with differences, if you were able to tell the difference, if you can tell us what was different between those wines for you. Uh, Joy? Yeah. Hey, I'm Mike. My, my computer microphone isn't great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. There, for me, there is definitely a structural difference, which totally makes sense because one has more alcohol and one has less. So um, that was the most obvious to me um, of all the attributes that I evaluated. And then before I forget, because it popped in my head, because I may or may not have had this experience myself, if you are going to start looking at these higher capitalizations and you haven't before, make sure you think about whether you're going to bleed or not. Um, and if you are going to bleed, wait until after um, <laughs> to add the sugar because <laughs> your liquid volume changes drastically. <laughs> yeah, that, that, is a, that is a good point, Emily. And, and we'll talk, actually, that's, we're going to pick that point up a little bit at the end when we look, we're going to compare our predicted alcohols with our actually the alcohols we got and talk about that a little bit later. So, um, so I'm, I'm curious, you said that you felt like there was a difference in the structure. Can you kind of say what you felt the structure was for each one? So definitely for the chapitalized, for me, it had more structure, more length. The tannins, you know, and you can see with the numbers too, it felt like there were, um, for me, coarser tannins, but I liked that. Um, and more tannins on top of that. So it was a more structured wine. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just to bring up too, because it's one of my biggest concerns with chapitalization is just having that confidence of what your actual volume, liquid volume is and what that sugar add is going to, is actually going to convert to is kind of, um, you know, feels like it moves around a lot, you, you know, um, whether you get your volume correct or incorrect, whether you end up at 14% or a lot lower than you expected. So it's something that I'd love to talk about too, is kind of basic working math on volume across varietals too. Merlot is a little easier because it's pretty consistent. If you start looking at Petit Verdot and um, you know other clones of Cab Franc, which have less sort of liquid volume on different vintages, then the sugar addition gets confusing. Yeah, and, and like, I, well, I'm glad you bring that up. And I, we will look at that in that slide at the end because I wanna make sure we include Metju's data in that as well, because we'll have several experiments at that point to kind of see how are we doing on making that um, making that estimate? So, okay, other folks, anything else that you noticed that was different between the wines other than the astringency? I guess I'm interested. Maybe we can use the we'll, we'll practice the raise hand feature. I'm I'm really excited to to try to see how this works. Um, so, if you um, were you able to see a difference in the color? So, if you were able to see a difference in the color, can you hit your your reaction to raise your hand, see if this works. 
Okay, I see AJ's clapping. So I'm thinking that that means that she, she saw the difference. Anybody else able to see the difference? Um, just able. So Emily's physically raising her hand. <laughs> okay. Okay, what about astringent? So, okay, let's see if we can. What about astringency? Were you able to, who else was able to like taste the difference in the astringency? If you can use your raise hand feature that way. No? Not many. Okay, so let's go. I'm, I, oh, there we go. Emily's got her hand down. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the, the preference here. I think um, we've got kind of a mixed set of preferences. So some folks preferred the unchaptalized wine and some preferred the chaptalized wine. So I'm interested to hear, um, you know, why, why you had that preference. So maybe somebody who preferred the unchaptalized wine, what was it that you that you liked about that wine? AJ, do you still have your hand up from before or are you trying to, do you want to talk? So Joy, Joy for me, it was the, I think the, the perceptible differences were really, really subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think on, I liked, for me, it was 102. So I, it was the unchaplized one. To me, it was, I think aromatically, it was a little, tasted a little more pure. It smelled a little more pure to me. Okay. And on the palate, though, the, the tannins, we're a little softer. I I enjoy that wine better. I think um, I didn't I didn't need that boost. I didn't think the wine needed that boost. Right. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, how about somebody who who preferred the chapterized wine? What what was what was what was it about the chapterized wine that you thought was that that sort of moved your preference? Anybody? I think, you know, it comes back to that, the age old question of what, what do you intend to do with this wine? So I preferred the chapitalized, mm -hmm. um, in, you know, that, that constant goal of, of aging these wines and keeping them in barrel and having some time, some time in barrel and in bottle. So in my head, <laughs> that's the direction I was going, but I really did, um, like the unchapitalized just for its purity, just as Todd said. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, what I love too is there's two completely different expressions um, that you can create, especially if you're working in tea bins and you know you have a lot, you can kind of, you can have two different colors of the same wine, you know, one that might go into your aging portfolio and one that's more for your, uh, let's bottle that, you know, next calendar year and not age out for a long time. So that's a hard question when you go to preference. I think it's like, I think we should always preface it. Um, if, if you're putting this in an aging portfolio, which is your preference. <laughs> yeah. um, That's a good point. And so I guess I would go back to Kirsty and say, Kirsty, given your winemaking goals and sort of what you're wanting to do with this wine, um, you know, where, where, after having done this and done that comparison, where do you think you'll land next year when your Merlot comes in? I think it's a really good tool to have different blending options. So I like the fact that we have a couple barrels that are a little bit more intense, a little bit more astringent. I don't think I would add this amount of sugar to every single thing, but I think in tea bins, it's a very easy thing to do. This was just free run taken from each of those four tea bins, and then I pressed the tea bins together. So I ended up having sort of three different expressions of the same from the same set of grapes. And I think that's interesting when it comes to blending to have more options. This will probably all, I mean, this Merlot will probably get blended with both pieces, but I think I will not be as shy about adding sugar as I have been in the past, because I think it is, it's nice to have more options. I think ultimately the wine perhaps will have more layers and more levels to it because there are these very different expressions using the same fruit. And it's such a good tool when you have a large lot, like, you know, when you're looking at 16 tons, 20 tons coming in, the thought of having that all exactly the same and um, sugar is just a really easy, you know, you don't have to deal with different fermentation curves by using different yeasts or, you know, worry about nutrients. It's, it's more of a, a same, same, but different. So you can go one with a higher ABV, one with a little lower and whammo blammo, two different ideas of the same wine. 
So any other comments about this experiment before we move on to the second one? And again, we'll kind of wrap up with some, some more of these ideas at the end, but any other questions or comments for Kirsty before we move on to our second experiment? Thank you, Kirsty. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead. I will go back. Oops, did that wrong again. Go. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring in our second experimenter for the day then, and that's Matthew Fino. So Matthew, I told a little bit of the story of how you started with this, but um, I, I also probably left some important pieces off. So you, you did this work yet, uh, last year, but you wanted to come back and do it again this year. So tell us a little bit about sort of your journey with chapelization and why did you wanna do this experiment again this year? Uh, ju just to confirm the result, uh, mainly I just wanted to, uh, uh, so there, I mean, there's two reasons, like when I've done it in 2019, it was a very ripe uh, vintage. Uh, so I've done it on a, on a Merlot that did add uh, some leaf roll virus. Uh, I mean, still have some leaf roll virus. So by having leaf roll virus and my uh, ripening was usually stagging around like 20, 21 breaks and never able to get much, much higher than 21 breaks. And the problem is this block I know is good and usually goes, it used to go in my higher hand uh, wine, but, um, but having something that, you know, uh, 11 and a half percent alcohol wasn't really my goal for this wine. And so that's the reason why last year I've done it on, on, the, on the Merlot. Uh, this year I wanted to do on Cabernet Franc, uh, mainly to check about the, the green component of it. Uh, but we run into trouble while trying to do the Cabernet Franc this year. Um, somebody didn't understand that it was an experimentation and did something different on one tea bean. So it ended up, I ended up doing it on, on the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, we don't grow Cabernet Sauvignon, but that's grapes that we bought uh, last year. Uh, and that's in some ways a good candidate because um, very often Cabernet Sauvignon is shit anyway, it doesn't get ripe. Uh, so that's a good way to uh, try to see if we can get something better with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so, and this year has been very, very rainy uh, and diluted. That also was, was, was a good, uh, Good candidate for that to to confirm or not if if it does make a difference. So I'll ask you the same question that I did Kirsty before we started. So you you mentioned that this normally would go into kind of a higher end. Like where was this wine supposed to go? What's the what's the wine making goal for this wine? And you know what is your kind of normal target for alcohol? Uh, this is this one. I don't know what I'm going to do with it um, because it's not it really doesn't fit in any on my portfolio. Uh, it's, it's, it's red wine. That's good. We'll see what we do with it. I'm not sure yet. Uh, here that was like the, the, the idea of, 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 uh, of doing an experimentation was, uh, playing with this Cabernet Sauvignon was just because I had these grapes and that was a perfect candidate. I didn't have anything in mind with this one and I'm still don't know what I'm going to do with it. So, but, but again, you know, what you, you play with grapes like that, that you don't care about that allows you to make uh, more decision on, on the wine that you really care about. And then you, you make informed decision and then you, you know, I feel much, much more confident if I, if I need to do something. Uh, I mean, to be honest, like with my experimentation last year and, and some unwanted experimentation that I've done in the past, I feel fairly confident now that I can easily add like 50, 60 grams per liter of sugar during fermentation and I will not be worried about it. I think for me, uh, I mean, we've talked Joy, about that in the past. I don't think really it matters how much you add of sugar. It matters what's your alcohol target. And, uh, and again, like what I found interesting into the surveys that you've done is most of people say that their target is between 13 and 13 and a half percent alcohol. And I think that's for me uh, what's more important. I mean, there's no, no, no point of adding like 60 grams per liter of, of sugar if you're already at 24 bricks, then you're really going to ruin your wine. Uh, so again, like chaptalization is a good tool for me, but you need to use it more to get to an alcohol target than, uh, than really saying, oh yeah, I, I can add 60 grams and be fine with it. Yeah. 
So we can, and we'll make sure to keep an eye on that today as we go through, like what were the actual targets here and what's the sensory that we're picking up for those, those respective targets. Mm -hmm. So the experiment itself, again, was super straightforward. And I think one other thing here, as, as has already come up, like if, if this is something that's intriguing to you, this is an easy experiment to do in any winery, whether it's through the WRE or not. You can always just sort of split your tea bins and add different amounts of sugar. So Mathieu took a single lot of Cabernet Sauvignon grapes and he, one, one set of, of fermentations got no chapitalization. One got 30 grams per liter of an addition and one got 60 grams per liter of addition. Um, and then everything else was kept the same uh, other than that. Um, to, so that you know what's in front of you. So you wanna, as we go through your, our chemistry and our sensory, if you are in group one, set, uh, wine 782 had no chapitalization. Wine 547 had 30 grams per liter and wine 926 had 60 grams per liter. If you're in group two, Wine 506 had no chapitalization. Wine uh, 472 had 30 grams per liter and wine 841 had 60 grams per liter. If you're in group three, wine 188 had no chapitalization. Wine 648 had, or I'm sorry, wine 527 had 30 grams and wine 648 had 60 grams. And if you're in group four, wine 883 had zero, had no chapitalization. Uh, wine 201 had 30 grams per liter and wine 363 had 60 grams per liter. So you can sort of maybe put those in order so you can compare them as we go through. So just to prove to ourselves that we started with comparable amounts, because again, this was one pick off of the vineyard, but then split. Um, the, the beginning chemistry for each of these was, was very much the same, particularly with regard to sugar. I'm not too worried about that difference in titratable acidity. I feel like TA moves a lot in those in that first couple of that first day or two. Um, so yeah, yeah, and also it's uh, in house uh, titration, so that kind of yeah. viability. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So so I, I do feel like we have pretty comparable um, a pretty comparable chemistry to to start with here. Um, when we look at the finished chemistry of these wines, much like we saw before. We don't see a big difference in volatile acidity, pH, or TA in these wines, but we do see obviously the alcohol, the difference in alcohol that we were trying to achieve with chapitalization. And just a word here, um, Mathieu was able, basically Mathieu, we, we followed the chemistry of two different barrels per um, chapitalization rate. Um, this isn't a, a, a fermentation replicate like Hershey's was, but this is a, essentially an aging replicate to say if something goes Pinky in one barrel, we know that we've got chemistry on the other barrel. So again, we can see that the unchapitalized wine was, was not even at 10.5% alcohol. The 30 grams per liter got to about 11.8%, and the 60 grams per liter got up to 13%. So thinking about what your capitalization targets are, you can kind of figure out where you would normally land um, within that range. The, the the pHs are not 3.9 or 4. I, I think every, I mean that's been corrected since yeah, yeah. Uh, all the all the wines were around like 3.8. Yeah, that's just, a good point. So we took this chemistry. I mean 317, 8, 3, 3.8. Yeah, we took this chemistry in in March and then Metu did an additional one gram per liter tartaric addition to to all of them. So they all got the same tartaric additions all along. Uh, but just to sort of make that wine stable for, for longer term aging. Uh, so what you're, yeah, what you're tasting is a little bit more acidic than that. Um, in this case, so one of the things we saw in Christie's experiment was a little bit of shift in color. We did not see that shift in color here. So again, one of the benefits of having multiple experiments around the same theme is that we can say, is this a consistent thing that we see? In this case, we didn't have a consistent difference in color. The biggest difference in color here, again, was, was between two different barrels within the same lot, probably due to the amount of free sulfur that was in that particular lot. So we may see a, a shift in color with, with ethanol, but it's not something, for example, that you would see every single time. Uh, Lee Lee's making a yeah, comment so about that. So, so Lee, yeah, so that's a good question, Lee. And we're going to look at that, like, again, we're going to sort of look at that at the end, but we, but I think that gets back to, there's a couple of things that go along with that. One of those is what Emily was talking about before in doing that, um, that estimation of your volume. Um, and also alcohol conversion rate is somewhat affected by all kinds of different things, right? So um, how how your yeast are fermenting, what their what their stress level is, what amount of um, heat you have. So 
But I think one of the bigger things that we see really is that that volume estimation rate. So, um, so, so definitely great question to ask. And again, that last slide that we look at, we'll sort of be able to compare that for all of these because that was something that came out of all of them. Um, I have a question with okay. for Kirsty and Matthew. Did you just flat out add the sugar or did you add it? And then I know Kirsty, yours was fermenting, so it's a little bit more challenging. And Matthew, was yours fermenting when you added sugar or was it pre-ferment? Um, it, it was pre-ferment. I don't know. Matthew, it was. Thank you. <laughs> so Matthew <laughs> added it the same day he added yeast. Um, okay. And do you recheck? And that's something that, you know, I have definitely in the past. Absolutely not. I cannot recheck because yeah. the thing with, uh, with red is I don't crush. So yeah. you don't crush. So if I was rich taking my, my reading would be much, much higher than what, what it really is. Another thing is when you press, you extract more from the, from the pulp that it doesn't, didn't get any, any sugar addition in the pulp. So I think it's like, there's no point of checking. You can check on the white wine if you want, if you do it on the white wine, but on the red, it will always get you a wrong result. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Um, when we so again we didn't see that difference in color when we look at the anthocyanin difference here that's the second graph on the bottom here or the, the the graph on the bottom we almost had this the opposite effect on anth anthocyanins if if that's a real effect at all we we basically had lower anthocyanins in the finished wine um, with higher tetralization but we did see the same effect on tannin so our the the tannin level did go up again um, essentially along along the the line or linearly with um, with the amount of chaptalization that occurred there. And again, that makes that makes a lot of good chemical sense um, as we think about that. So, um, Todd, everything is dry, Todd. And there's no no sugar in the wine. It's completely dry, done with malolactic fermentation. No 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 rice. Yeah, that's a great question. Basically, if I don't <laughs> or a malic acid level or a residual sugar level, that means that both of them were zero. Um, but it's important. It is a good question, especially with these higher levels to ask that as well. So, um, okay, so we've got one more graph here and then we'll kind of go to our, um, we'll, we'll go to sensory, but this is sort of that idea that, that we've kind of been talking about all along is, you know, how much, how much alcohol do we expect to get from our sugar addition? How do we calculate that? And then how do these things line up when we say, what did we predict versus what we got? So when I did the predictions here, I used the, I used rates that, that I, I used to use all the time, but also are in the literature. So um, a, a quick calculation of potential alcohol can be done by your BRICS, BRICS level um, multiplying by a conversion factor. Now that conversion factor is different for different, the literature basically will report anything from 0.56 to 0.6. Um, and, and we used to basically use the lower amount of that for like a red wine fermentation that would be warmer and faster and the higher number there for a white wine fermentation that was cooler and slower. And if we had something in the middle, like a, a barrel fermentation of a white, we would maybe use 0.58. Um, but that's kind of a back of the envelope quick way to do it. I would say that at least in, in my experience, and I'd be interested to hear from others that um, the BRICS number there, if you're taking your BRICS with a refractometer for that calculation, it seems to be a little bit more um, accurate than if you're using a hydrometer or an Anton Parr. So if you're just trying to do that, it's useful to kind of, you know, take your, take your sample from your T-bin, but then sort of put it through your refract instead of your hydrometer for that particular calculation for whatever reason. But you can see that, you know, with that with that range of conversion factors, you can get a protect, predicted alcohol anywhere from 11.2 to 12%, depending on which side of that factor you use. So I think the first rule here is that there's not, when, when we're predicting our alcohols, it, we're predicting essentially a range based on all those things that we know could be different. So the yeast conversion rate and the temperature um, and, and other things in the wine matrix and whether the yeast are gonna convert to making glycerol versus making alcohol for us. And, and then the other addition rate or the other calculation there is how do I know how much sugar to add to change my alcohol? And again, the literature reports things from 16 to 18, but most of the time it's either 16 or 17 grams per liter, giving you 1% alcohol. And again, that's subject to the range for the same reason. So if we look at, um, basically I took all of the chapitalization experiments that the WRE has done in the last couple of years. So Mathieu did his Merlot experiment last year. He also did a Malbec experiment. And then we've got Kirstie's um, Blenheim experiment this year. 
And there's actually two different ways of calculating um, our predicted on her her sugar addition. We can we can do it from the sugar from the bricks plus the sugar addition. So that's our 347 44 sugar. 347 we added 44 grams per liter, and that was based on the bricks number or the actual 44 grams per liter. And then we could also do it from that bricks number that she got. Um, and then we have Mechi's, Mechi's experiments from this year. So what we can see is that we do have somewhat of a, of a they're, they're not always the same, right? And sometimes that's a very small difference, but sometimes that's a fairly large difference. For example, if we look at, you know, the King family Merlot from last year, you know, these higher capitalization rates, that's almost like a half, half to three quarters of a percent of alcohol. Um, so that is, a, that is a fairly big difference. And, and I think, prob I'm not, I don't know the whole answer to why that is, but I would suspect that it has to do with kind of the conglomeration of all those factors, figuring out what that volume is really gonna be um, and figuring out what your alcohol conversion rates are gonna be. Just realizing when you're doing your capitalization that you're sort of aiming at a range and not like at the strict target. Um, because it's, it's, it's a very hard target to hit in a strict way. So, um, so with that though, I, I do, I would like to kind of go and, and talk about your sensory impressions of these wines. Um, so let me see, here we go. So I had a couple of, um, of poll questions. I wasn't sure exactly which poll questions to ask here, um, but these were the things I was curious about. So hopefully we'll, we'll get there. So the first question was, you know, fill in the blank. If adding, when Mechi was adding 60 grams per liter, was that too much for you? Was that just right? Or was that not enough? Push it further. Um, which of the three wines did you, did you prefer? And I, and as we've talked about, that probably has more to do with what your, what your goal is for that wine. But if you did have one that you felt like, you know what, this was too much this or too much that, um, we, we can talk about that in the discussion. And then, um, based on what you taste today, what's your, you know, going forward, do you have a change in, or what, what are you thinking about in terms of limits to chop location? Um, so uh, the, the thing that I also wanted to add on that is I was trying to go too much with the 60. Right. I mean, uh, we'll see how, what people feel about it, but I was straight, really trying to go too much. I wanted to pass the 14% alcohol with it, going from like uh, a 10% to a 14, 14 and a half. That was my initial goal because I wanted to see if I could, if I can push it too much. Uh, but again, my conversion rate not being as good as, as I was expecting, then I'm, I'm just right in what I call the sweet zone for me. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't feel I, I truly succeeded what, 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 I, what I was planning to do with, with, with this wine. Uh, nevertheless, I, I, I find the, the result being quite interesting. Yeah, I have a note, Mathieu, from when you and I first talk, talked about this, I have a note that you wanted to go big. So um, yes. based on what we did last year, you had to say, okay, well, let's go big and see how far we can push it. Um, and, and I'll try to do a little bit of, of research before I put out the final reports on this to see. Um, I had a conversation with Nicola Hall a couple of years ago when we um, had some, uh, I think it was in 2019, and she was saying that like the yeast conversion rates kind of do change depending on what your sugar environment is. So it might be the kind of thing that as you get to those really high sugar rates, your yeast just don't do as good a job of converting those. So I'll try to run that down and, and make sure it's in the report too. So if we are thinking about doing these larger, um, these larger capitalizations, that might become a factor. And there might be some way, Nicola might know, for example, a, a way to kind of think about how to do that um, in order to kind of get to that target if we really want to get there, so. But, but, but also that, that, that gets to the point about, you know, your, your question asking like, what's your comfortable rates when it comes to gram per sugar? For me, it will be more like, uh, ultimately the, the targeted alcohol more than the, again, because I'm not going to add the same quantity of sugar, even if I'm comfortable now in 60 gram, I'm still going to do that uh, on, my, on my 24 bricks per tiverdo. You know, so it's. Uh, I think that uh, yes, I'm comfortable with fair amount, but I think it needs to always be correlated to what's your final goal. Yeah, so I guess I would ask you that, Matthew. Like having done these, where where do you end up landing in terms of kind of that target that you think is the sweet zone for you? Like where where is that? Target I mean, it's between your style. It's between 30, 13 and thirteen and a half. Uh, I mean, every time. Uh, I overdone it, and every time I ended up to this zone, I, I did feel that the wine was tasting better than 
than if I'm lower than that. So, and I, I think that the part of it that is probably based on like this, this kind of like sweet feeling that the alcohol bring and Todd's question I think was very interesting because for me, uh, and that's not something that we've asked into the, into the survey, but I, I, did, I, I did get much more sweet feeling, uh, uh, I mean, almost sweet perception on the 60 gram than I did get on any of the other ones, so. Yeah, and, I, and we will, I think that tends to show up in like the, the, the questions about fruit. So we'll, we'll take a look and see if we get any, if we get significant differences in those numbers on fruit. Um, okay, so let's take a look here. We, uh, <laughs> so we've got, um, we've got nobody wanting to push it further than 60 in this case, um, but we've got kind of a 50-50 in terms of whether that felt like it was a little bit too far or whether that felt like it was kind of in the, in the sweet spot. Um, and we have kind of a, a, a total spread in terms of which wines were preferred and we'll, we'll follow up on that in just a second. And then um, it looks like we're sort of still sitting there at about 3% is, is the most common um, sort of limit for chapelization. But again, you're right, that, that question might just be what's your sweet spot. So I'd like to go back to this question though about what, what people's preferences were. If somebody, um, somebody who preferred the unchapelized wine, if somebody is willing to tell us what you liked about the unchapelized wine, what was that presenting for you that you didn't find in the other ones? Anyone? Anybody? I, I, I want to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious. Maybe we'll we'll go to the. How about how about how about somebody who's got who's at that 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 um that thirty gram range? If, and if somebody is in that, if somebody who chose the unchapelized wine that's able to unmute and tell us about it, we would love to hear that. But um, either one of those lower levels, anybody willing to tell us? Kirsty, you've got your hand up. Yep, I prefer the thirty grams per liter edition. I felt that the fruit was a lot of bright strawberry. Um, I liked, I liked the, the sixty gram ad, but I thought it was just a little, a little too much as a standalone wine in a blend. I think it, I think it can work really nicely. But I like the the lots of strawberry I got from the the thirty gram per liter ad. Thank you. I mean, even for me on a personal level, I will put like the thirty and the sixty more into the same category. Uh, I mean, I, I, on a personal level, I did like the 60 better, but that will not surprise Kirsty anyway. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I do find them like uh, more interesting than the zero. I mean, like for me, for me, they, there's a, no matter what, there's a, on based on my palate, there's a good, there's a big improvement. Uh, and I think the change between zero to 30 is much more important than between 30 and 60. And I think maybe that difference too between 30 and 60 reflects your respective winemaking styles and the, the types yeah, yeah, of Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's that's born out of a lot of different things. But um, but yeah, so I think there's something about getting into that like 12%, you know, 12% and above tastes very different than like 10 and a half does. Um, and that's a that's a big difference, I think. Other comments on, on the, the difference between these different chapelization levels? Anything else that we haven't said yet or that you have for impressions of these wines? So Joe, I, I was gonna say that on the, on, um, on the first group, I liked the unchapelized better. On the second group, I liked the, the 60 better. So I, I'm just wondering how much of it is a uh, <laughs> varietal slash vintage you know, I mean, I think in some cases you would, it, it kind of shows how maybe sometimes you, you're going to want to push it. Uh, and other times maybe you just, you just let the, the fruit be the fruit. Yeah. Well, and, and, I, and that's funny, Todd, because then that blows our idea that it's about winemaking style, right? Because you're, you, you, you're choosing both sides, but, but yeah, I mean, I think different variety, what you want to express from different varieties might, might be part of that too, um, for sure. Yeah, but Kirsty, your alcohol level on your base wine was also not super low. It was 11.5, no? Yeah. Um, so at 11.5, you're low, but you're still into, an, uh, I would say, a, a normal uh, target zone. I mean, it's it's low, but it's not too, too low. Yeah, like 10.5% alcohol for red wine, it's 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 super low. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's there's really something missing for me at, at this level. Yeah. 
Also, anything below 11% for me, I worry about microbial stability. So the, the base limit that I have for wines is 11%. Below that, it just makes me too nervous from a microbiological standpoint. And I would say too, that for people that are aging longer, that number might be higher, right? Because you're, you're bottling out within a year. If folks are over vintaging, for example, that number um, might be a little bit higher. So for, for, for me, the, the main takeaway from that is, yeah, like, you know, if, if, for example, I do a, a lifestyle Cabernet Franc and my lifestyle Cabernet Franc, I want to target the 11 and a half percent alcohol. So for that specific uh, thing, I'm not going to over it. Right. Uh, Playing with this Cabernet Sauvignon that's clearly under ripe was fun for me because then you can really see what, what it does. But I think it's it, it gives you the for me I I, I did get I do get a, a clear difference of ripeness perception and I air quote uh, ripeness perception between the the, the control and, uh, and 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 the other one and that for me what's interesting because it still gives me the tools in bad year um, to to react. Uh, don't get me wrong, my goal is to not use any sugar. I think we're probably all in the same situation. But now I feel like much more comfortable that if I've got a bad vintage, I've got no problem dumping tons of sugar. And it's a lot. When you, when you, when you add 60 grams per liter into a tea bin, uh, that's scary. Uh, it, like you, you think you're going to do some jam or something like that. It's, uh, but... Uh, but but again, like now, I feel much more comfortable of doing it. And uh, you know, we've been talking about like, oh, should we try to do it again next year? Uh, uh, now it's a part of my uh, uh, my practice in the, in the, in the cellar. Is that I will not ask too much. Like you know, I will have no problem to do it on a five-ton tanks. Uh, you know, just depending on my target and what what I want to do with this wine. If I need to do it, uh, I'll get sixty grand per liters and and be fine with it. Yeah, I was really curious, and I don't think we stopped. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we saw a lot of greenness in any of these wines, even at very low bricks. So I would be curious in a year that you have more of those green tendencies, um, how the sugar would affect it. Because that's yeah. what I'm most nervous about is really green, underripe tasting green fruit and how the alcohol influences that. I don't think we were able to see that through these particular wines. What else do you want to do with a, a Cabernet Sauvignon at 19 bricks? I mean, how low can I go <laughs> to get some greenness? <laughs> <laughs> even at that low bricks i didn't take a huge amount of greenness no, no i agree i would like to try to do that with something loaded with metoxypyrosine to really see the difference right. but again if, if anybody wants to do it you just need to tb in it's easy uh i think i'm done with it but i'll be very happy if somebody's got a green uh cabernet franc green cabernet sauvignon and they want to try it i'll be very happy to taste it yet, next year yeah and, and I'll, I'll just second that, that if, if anybody does have one of those lots come in, you know, in September and you want to, you want to try to do this, I'm happy to take a bunch of chemistry for you. So just give me a call. So, okay. Any other um, last, last comments about chaptalization before we wrap it up for the day today? We want to make sure to uh, thank the Virginia Wine Board for continuing to fund the Winemakers Research Exchange. They provide funding for all of the the chemistry that you see in front of you um, and the ability to run these programs. And I will say we have been funded again for next year, um, which means that it's time to start thinking about experiments for next year. So if there is anything that we've talked about through the course of this year, this year, if there's anything you've read about in Wine Business Monthly, if there's anything that, you know, one of your um, product reps is talking to you about that you'd like to set up as an experiment, um, please let me know. I would love to, to come alongside you and design an experiment that really works for your seller and for your winemaking style. Um, we also want to make sure to thank Mitchie Pino and Kirsty Harmon for, um, for doing these experiments, for getting all of their samples and information in, and for sharing their wines with us today. Um, and again, if this is an easy thing for anybody to do, so you would like to just set one up in your winery and want to talk through it, I'm happy to do that as well. So thanks so much for joining us today. Do take a look at those, um, the last two scheduled sensory sessions. Again, the invitations are out. So um, May 13th, ambient fermentations and uh, June 3rd, uh, managing acids in Petit Bordeaux. So um, if you're interested in either one of those, go ahead and, and sign up now so that we can make sure to save a spot for you. So. Thanks everybody for joining us today and we will hopefully see you next time. Thank you.